According to Fitbit, what is the uh, optimum number of steps that you are that we are to achieve every day? Is it 10,000? Okay, I think Kaylun is on the verge of achieving 40,000 steps a day, and he's going to be the most physically fit man in the world at any moment now. <coughs> Let us pray. Yes, Nico. Yes, that's right. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks and praise for who you are and for all that you do for us. Uh, we thank you for blessing us with a glorious fall day in your creation and the opportunity to worship you once again in spirit and in truth. I uh, thank you for the opportunity, the ability to share our lives with one another, uh, to lean on each other in times of need, to rejoice with each other in times of thanksgiving. Uh, Lord, our hearts are absolutely broken uh, with what is going on in Israel and Palestine. Uh, we have no hope but you, uh, nowhere to turn but you. We pray that you might bring justice and peace and healing to your holy land and all of your children there. Now, Lord God, we ask that you would bless us with the word that we need to hear, that you would grant us wisdom and enlightenment, that you would increase our faith all this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> My sermon text for this morning is the gospel lesson for today. Matthew chapter 22, verses 15 through 22. My sermon title for today is based on verse 21 and the older translation of that. My sermon title for today is Rendering Unto God. Rendering Unto God. Today's reading is the second of five consecutive stories showing Jesus in controversy with the various leaders of his Jewish people. Previous to this, we had a dispute over his authority with the chief priest and the elders. Today, we have this controversy over paying taxes with the Pharisees and the Herodians. Next, the issue will concern resurrection from the dead, wherein he is confronted by the Sadducees. Following that, a Pharisee who happens to be a lawyer will test him concerning the greatest commandment of all. And finally, the issue of the identity of God's Messiah is disputed with yet more Pharisees. All of these instances occur in chapters 21 and 22 of Matthew's Gospel. Jesus has just triumphantly entered into the holy city of Jerusalem, riding humbly on a donkey at the beginning of the previous chapter on that original Palm Sunday. So the context of these controversies and surrounding parables is the last week of his life before he is sentenced to death by crucifixion. The challenges are picking up steam, as it were. His opponents are multiplying and uniting against him. The controversies are becoming heightened, and his opponents are seeking to ensnare him in blasphemy and heresy or sedition and treason. The skies overhead are becoming increasingly ominous, and dark storm clouds amass. The Pharisees are a lay group of God's chosen people, the Jews, who are not ordained priests, but are very concerned with a close and scrupulous following of God's laws by God's covenanted people. The Herodians are a political group associated with the old king, Herod the Great, and now with his son, Herod Antipas. They initially engage Jesus the way many of us do when we're trying to entrap our opponents or enemies we butter them up. They feign sincere appreciation for this quirky Galilean rabbi and perhaps prophet. Teacher, we know that you are sincere, that you teach the way of God in accordance with truth and show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality. Then comes the question, the trap. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful? to pay taxes to the emperor or not. They are seeking, of course, to embroil Jesus in perhaps the chief political controversy of his day, namely the subjection and rule of his Jewish nation by the pagan Roman Empire. 
The Jewish nation was a tiny nation and had been ruled by much larger nations and empires for much of its existence. Under the oppressive thumbs of Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Persia, Greece, and now Rome, the Jews, like any other smaller peoples and culture, yearn to breathe free and experience self-rule. Indeed, part of messianic fervor was for a Messiah to rise up and restore sovereignty to the nation and to the people of Israel. Hence, in this context of this line of questioning, if Jesus approves of paying taxes to Rome, he acknowledges, in one commentator's words, foreign pagan sovereignty over Israel and risks offending the nationalistic parties of his day, including the zealots. But if he disapproves, he could be reported as disloyal to the empire. Either way, you see, he gets in hot trouble with somebody. But Jesus, the text says, aware of their malice, said, Why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. Then he said to them, Whose head is this? And whose title? The older translation says, Whose likeness? Whose inscription is this? They answered, The emperor's. The older translation, Caesar. Then he said to them, Give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. The older translation, Render therefore unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. One commentator says about Jesus' response here, It accepts the state as it is, as the lesser of two evils, the worst being anarchy. It does not accept the state's claim to be divine. God's claim is greater than the state's. Another commentator remarks, Jesus' words distance him from those who oppose Rome. At the same time, the inclusion of giving to God what is God's relativizes the political obligation. There is here no firm principle of loyal submission to the state, implied rather is a reservation regarding the state and a lack of reservation regarding God. While obedience to God can, as in this current instance, coexist with doing what the state requires, obligation to God overshadows obligations to the state. So there is no simple or straightforward rule, only the imperative to weigh the demands of two very unequal authorities. When those demands are not at odds, as here, obligations to both can be met. In cases of conflict, however, it is manifest which authority requires allegiance. Jesus then seems to be advocating some sort of middle way, as it were, undoubtedly convincing and wise to some and unconvincing and prevaricating to others. This issue, of course, of God versus the state, of where our loyalties lie and how much of them is absolutely timeless. It is relevant to every day and age, every generation, whether Christianity is empowered or persecuted. Almost every human and civil rights issue that you can think of wrestles with whether to adhere to certain laws of the land or to protest them, and if so, in what fashion. Think of the civil rights movement, abortion or reproductive health issues, Black Lives Matter, the Moral Monday movement, transgender bathroom usage and sports issues, just to name a few. The issue of taxation remains forever vexing. While most people recognize the need for public services, most people also don't like to part with too much of the money that they have earned. Ultimately, of course, it's a matter of where you draw the line what rate at which to tax and for whom. Opinions politically and economically are all over the map and get to the heart of what we think is fair and just. Overall, biblically speaking, the state, the nation, and by that I mean the government, gets mixed reviews. Peter seems to speak highly of it in his first letter when he writes, be subject 
for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to praise those who do right. Honor all people, love humanity, fear God, honor the emperor. Paul Likewise, seems to echo that same opinion as he writes to the Romans, let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, those who resist the authorities resist what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment. For the same reason, you also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God attending to that very thing. Pay all of them their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, revenue to whom revenue is due, etc., etc., etc. Now, on the other hand, John in Revelation chapter 13 portrays the state, the government, as not only incorrigibly corrupt and oppressive, but downright evil. Whether government and God go together, and if so, to what extent, or they are in essence opposed to each other, all of that depends upon time, place, circumstance, and scripture cited. And at least for today, we look to Christ and attempt to glean wisdom and guidance from his exhortation. Render therefore unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. Jesus bases this ultimate answer upon his earlier question. Whose likeness and inscription is this? As he points to the coin that they have brought him. As the image and the likeness are of Caesar, he therefore responds, render unto Caesar the things like this coin that are Caesar's. That, of course, begs the question, well, then what things are God's? that are then rendered unto God. And that leads to a second question. If the image and likeness on the coin identifies it as belonging to Caesar, what or who bears the image and likeness of God that bears it or them as belonging to God? I hope you're as familiar with the answer as I am. Humanity, human beings, men, women, children. At the pinnacle of creation, on the sixth day of God's original act, God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So if we render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, that indicates some form of service or allegiance to the governing authorities. But if we render unto God the things that are God's, we are most fundamentally rendering unto God our very life. Our very beings. The things that belong to God are us, my friends. For we bear his image and his likeness. Though one could argue that those were lost or at least diminished in the fall of humanity as it relates to Adam and Eve's partaking of the forbidden fruit, a concept known as original sin, whereby sin and death entered God's good creation and reigned subsequently. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Word made flesh, He in whom the fullness of God was pleased to dwell bodily, has come to restore that very image and cleanse that very likeness. He has atoned for our sins, gaining pardon for us by the blood of the cross and reconciled us back to God with the free gift of salvation, of righteousness, and of eternal life. And through that redemption by God, we are now, as Paul tells the Corinthians, beholding the glory of Jesus being changed into his likeness from one degree of glory unto another. As bearers of the image, as bearers of the likeness of God. We belong to him. We are his. And because he's God, 
Nothing, no one can change or alter that fact. Neither death nor life, neither things present nor things to come shall ever be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Our lives are His. Our times are His. Our breath is His. Our heartbeat is His. Our love is His. Our gifts and talents are His. Are his. Our money, though a portion will always go to Caesar, is his also. In him we live and move and breathe and have our very being. All that we are, all that we have come from God. Our lives, our unique fingerprints, the numbers of hairs on your head, our lives' trajectories and family and friends and jobs and careers are all stamped with the image and emblazoned with the likeness of him who said let there be light and there was light of him who said let my people go and then parted the Red Sea of him who said in me you have peace in the world you have tribulation but you can be of good cheer because I have overcome the world of him who said I am the resurrection and the life those who believe in me though they die yet shall they live and whoever lives and believes in me shall never die of him who said it is done I am the Alpha and and the Omega, the beginning and the end, I make all things new. Our lives are all stamped with the image, emblazoned with the likeness of him who said in our first lesson, a sign for today from Isaiah 45, I call you by name, though you do not know me. I arm you, though you do not know me. Of him who said, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the river they shall not overwhelm you when you walk through fire and guess what you will you shall not be burned and the flame shall not consume you for I am the Lord your God the Holy One of Israel your Savior our lives are all stamped with the image emblazoned with the likeness of him who said I have borne you from your birth I have carried you from your womb even to old age I am he and to gray hairs I will carry you I have made and I will bear I will carry and I will save of him who said a thousand may fall at your side 10,000 may fall at your right hand but it will not come near you of him who said no one shall ever snatch you out of my hand aren't you glad my friends that that's our image and our likeness that that's our destiny aren't you glad that he is our God and we are his children and aren't you glad that we can therefore render unto him <laughs> render our praise Render our thanksgiving. Render our gratitude. Render our appreciation. Render our humility. Render our service. Render our worship. Render all that we are and all that we have. Render our tithes and offerings. Render our adoration. Render our very lives to the praise of His glory. Both now and forever. Amen and amen. Rendering unto God the things that are God's. Amen.